This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Demore, author of two New York Times best-selling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co-host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to AskLisa at drlisademore.com. Episode 76, how and when do I tell my kids their grandma is dying? Well, there seems like some hope with spring around the corner. There does. Oh, Rena, to have the windows open <laughs> is making my days so much better. Yeah. I just, oh, I love fresh air so much. I'm just thrilled that they're hopefully getting rid of daylight savings time, so... You know, that would be a wonderful thing. It is ridiculous, and it makes my family so miserable. <laughs> you were saying this once on an Instagram Live that, that you can tell, like, kids are just a total mess when they lose that one hour of sleep. Well, and mostly you just feel so bad for their teachers, you know, sending yes. them to school when you so know true. That they're kind of a wreck. So true, so true. Um, t- uh, speaking of time um, and how valuable it is and how much we've realized that in this pandemic, we got a letter asking about grief. And when do you let someone know that their grandparents are dying? I'm going to read you this letter, Lisa. Dear Dr. Lisa, my kids 10 and 12 are lucky to have a close relationship with their Nana, my husband's mother. We live locally, and Nana's been a big part of their lives, including regular visits. The past few years have been a roller coaster of cancer diagnosis, surgery, chemo that is working, and chemo that is not working. Treatment options are now exhausted. Nana has recently entered home hospice care. Right now, she's generally feeling, looking, acting herself, but we adults know that time grows short, and at some point in the coming weeks or months, we will all have to say goodbye. Dr. Lisa, would you please offer guidance for breaking this news to my children? Should we wait until there are unmistakable physical signs of progressing illness or start talking about Nana's prognosis right away? Additionally, my husband and I will be on the front lines of -of end-of-life caregiving, and it may be difficult or impossible to shield our children from the realities of Nana's final illness. Should we even try? We would so benefit from your steady, calm perspective on grief and grieving alongside precocious middle grade kids. Likewise, suggestions of books to read together or separately are very welcome. Thank you. Ah, do you know what got to me about this is I think it's something all of us will have to deal with. Yep. Yep. This is, this is the normal course of events. And um, something we all need to be prepared to help our kids through. So where does she begin? Well, my inclination is to be honest and to really be upfront about it. Because at 10 and 12 especially, kids are picking up a lot of information. You know, and if, if this woman has already been moved into home hospice care, you know, she may in many ways, look and feel like the Nana they remember. But if they know her as well as this letter writer says they do, they have to be aware that something is different Mm -hmm. at, at minimum. And what happens when kids become aware that something is changing or different, and yet the adults aren't saying anything about it, they start to think, wow, like, why can't we talk about this? What am I not aware of that makes this something that even my parents can't bring up with me? Mm. And so there's no downside besides their sadness to telling them the truth, that grandma is sick and there's nothing anymore that doctors can do to help her. The doctors have done everything they can and she will die from what has made her sick. I think that may be the place to start. Mm. I mean, I'm curious about why you don't shield them. Because you say they're going to pick up on this. They're going to know. It's almost worse that you don't talk about it. Yeah, because it is part of life. And, you know, maybe one of the things that's so strange about coming out of this pandemic is that we've had this very bizarre, completely unusual landscape around illness and death and disease and fear. And 
what we have to remember is that people coming to you know a point in their life where either they get sick or they're dying from old age or some combination of the both this is how it's always been and this is very much part of what it means to be human and what we want always in caring for our kids is to lead the way in showing them that hard things are part of life there are ways we can make them more bearable Part of how we make those things more bearable is that we talk about them, we are forthright about them, we are mindful of how much anybody can tolerate at any given time. But that sort of turning and facing it quality that I think the parents may want to use now makes it all less frightening to children. When we are hiding from things that are expectable parts of life, when we are so cautious and anxious about them and our kids can tell, it actually all becomes more frightening. Mm -hmm. But what this family's up against is the kids are going to be really, really sad. And I think none of us want to say anything to our children that we know are going to make them really, really sad. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's why the instinct is sort of shield them for as long as you can and don't say anything. But you're saying that's actually worse. It is. But it's interesting, Rena, the way you put it, it, it makes me think about where's that instinct coming from? Because I think you're right. I think our instinct is like, don't tell the kids. Like, they don't need to know. They're happy. Why would I ruin their day? But whether we mean for it to be the case or not, I think sometimes it's the parent protecting themselves in that ah. moment, not protecting the child. Because, Rena, you know, as a parent, like when your kid's upset, it's awful. Right. It's painful to you. Yeah. And so I really feel for this letter writer because they actually are getting it coming and going. They're losing a parent Mm -hmm. who they love. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of sadness about that for sure. And they're also going to need to help their kids navigate their sadness. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we use the term sandwich generation for lots of things. Mm -hmm. But we could definitely say this parent's in an emotional sandwich, right, of having to deal with their own feelings about loss and grief, and then also do a, as good a job as possible in helping the kids deal with loss and grief. And I have all the empathy in the world for the parent being like, you know what, I don't want to eat this whole sandwich all at once. Like, I'm dealing with my own side yeah. of this. I don't know that I want to rush into my kid's grief. If I can hold it at bay or delay it, I certainly yeah. understand the instinct. I want to get into sort of the care taking aspect and everything. But I want to ask you, when you see kids going through grief, and I'm sure it's different based on age, what do you think parents don't think about and where they miss the mark on helping them cope with grief? Well, it's interesting because, you know, we have very different guidance age by age because sometimes the questions that are very high on a parent's mind are very different from the questions that are high on a Mm -hmm. a child's mind. So these kids are 10 and 12. So they, in all likelihood, understand the permanence of death, understand that a dead person can't feel things, you know, isn't going to be, you know, their body won't be working anymore, that when you're gone, you're gone. But younger kids don't always have that understanding. And so especially when we're telling children under the age of five about death, we often have to be very, very explicit around things like, you know, that plant we had that died and it stopped working and there was nothing we could do to bring it back. Well, the human body works that way too. Or, you know, that pet we had that died and we said goodbye and we never saw that pet again. We just held that pet in our hearts. Well, that happens with people too. So with the little kids, we have to be mindful of, they just don't get it. Like They just yeah. don't really understand. Even with... 10 and 12 year olds, and honestly, even with 30 and 40 year olds, the permanence of death is actually pretty hard for people to wrap their heads around. You know, there, there, there's such beautiful poetry about this idea of like, maybe the person's just in the other room or not, or going to mm. come back soon. You know, that it's so human to, um, to ward off the fullness of the reality. And we have to make room for kids to do that as well. You know, at 10 and 12, they may really need time to take in the permanence which is an argument for telling them sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to pause, take a quick break. On the other side, I want to ask you about how often you think kids should be visiting dying grandparents and also your sense of 
based on age group, how kids process death. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Ask Lisa podcast. Hey, Ask Lisa listeners, it's Rena. If you're looking for a new podcast, you should check out another project I'm working on. It's called The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, or HERO. HERO is a limited series podcast from Foreign Policy with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We ask the question, could empowering women in the workplace be the simplest way to boost the global economy moving forward? And if so, how do we get there? So come along with me as I talk to women all around the world in places like South Africa, Nigeria, and Pakistan, women who are changing the status quo in surprising ways. You can find the second season of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women wherever you get your podcasts. I hope you enjoy. Welcome back to the Ask Lisa podcast. We got a letter from a parent asking about how do you tell kids that their grandparent is dying? Lisa, what, you know, these, in this letter, these, um, her, her children are middle schoolers, obviously capable of processing things far differently than maybe a toddler. How do you deal with grief and explaining death based on age? So if we think then about the middle school group, you know, our kids who are well over age five, they know what it is. I think we want to be straightforward. And I think we really want to follow their lead in terms of how much they can tolerate at a time. So I do think it's important to be forthright with these kids to give them time to really be able to say goodbye to their grandmother. You know, one of the things I've sometimes heard is that people aren't really clear with kids or think kids understand things they don't, think kids understand that there's a looming death and then the child doesn't realize it. Mm -hmm. And then it all happens really fast and then the person's gone and they haven't really had a chance to take in what's happening. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's important to say, you know, look, your grandma's been sick. The doctors have done everything they can. There's nothing left to do. This illness will be, you know, what brings her to the end of her life. You know, just to be very straightforward and then to say, what questions do you have for me? And, and to make space and time for kids to take that in. The other thing I would do is, before any conversation like this, is give kids a chance to brace themselves, to say to kids, I have really, really sad news about Nana that we need to share with you. Mm. And that sentence is a huge gift to kids. It is a huge sort of you know, basically, kiddo, brace yourself. Mm. And they will almost always know what's coming. Wow. But even that, you know, just that five-second interval to kind of marshal their forces and brace themselves a little bit is a really kind thing to make possible. Knowing that she's dying, how often should kids be expected to visit? Because it must be painful for them as it is for the parent. It's a great question. So one is, I would follow the kid's lead. You know, I would okay. absolutely follow the kid's lead. And they may say, great, we want to see her every day. And you say, okay, great, she wants to see you every day. I mean, I think that there's real, um, real value in, in letting kids lead the way. If a kid is like, uh, let's say this isn't happening, like I don't want any part of this, I don't want to see her sick, I think it gets a little more complicated because there's two things you're trying to balance. You know, one is what would the grandma want to have happen? You know, and how would she want to? be mm -hmm. able to say goodbye or be close with her grandchildren and, you know, touch them and hug them and have that time. The other is, what will the kid be able to feel comfortable with in retrospect? Right? So if the child's like, I, I don't want to do this or it feels too uncomfortable, I think there's room for the parent to say, I understand completely and I want you to be able to look back on this time and feel comfortable with how it was handled. And I have a feeling that if you don't see her or say goodbye in a way that feels right, you're not going to feel okay about it later. And so we have to, let's see if we can come up with a solution that lets you do this. Isn't that a lot to put on a kid's plate to be like, how, how is this going to, how are you going to process this best? What do you want to do? And especially if grandma might not be the grandma that they remember and love who could be fading. That's also dramatic, isn't it? To see that? Yep. Yep. No, Rena, you are a hundred percent right. I mean, this is a real tension the parents sitting in. But it gets to something else. And I would this guidance to me feels really important, whether the kid's like, Yep, I want to see her every day, or no, I'm feeling uncomfortable about it. We have to prepare kids for what they're gonna see. And 
what the letter writer is saying is that right now, you know, she looks and seems pretty, you know, like familiar, like the grandmother they remember. But even if there's small adjustments, it is, it's almost like saying, you know, giving that kid a chance to brace themselves when you're saying, I've got some really sad news. It is critically important that we say, okay, when you see a grandma, you will notice that she has lost weight. Or when we're taking kids to hospital visits, you know, whether or not it's end of life visits, I have to tell you, Rena, hospitals, kids see a lot. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. one thing I have learned clinically is when I have really actually a client of any age, you know, who has been to the hospital to see a loved one or who, you know, was in the hospital, I have learned to say, did you see things that were upsetting to you? And Rena, I cannot tell you how often the thing they saw in the hallway on the way into the room Mm -hmm. where they were headed or to walk into a room and to see a post-surgical parent who may have come through the surgery just fine, but is swollen in a way that's unexpected or has tubes in places that are unexpected. Yeah. That piece, I, I just, I can't overstate clinically how much I've come to appreciate that the visuals that sometimes go along with major medical procedures or end of life experiences are jarring to people in a way that we, I think, tend to kind of breeze right past. Right. Um, and you know how, Rena, like, it's one thing to see the movie, it's another thing to read the book. Yes. You kind of can't unsee things. Right, right. Um, so I would really put a lot of energy into preparing kids for what they're going to see at every step of the way, and then giving them some, maybe some options like, okay, I'm not ready for that, or I don't want to see that, or, you know, something in that way, but... The visual piece, Rena, I cannot overstate how um, – also how hidden it becomes. It's, it's amazing to mm. me clinically where I will um, – someone will come in, they'll talk about a grief experience or visiting someone in the hospital, worrying about their health. And then when I say, did you see anything that was upsetting, they'll be like, oh, I did. You know, And it was it's so clear it was never going to come up any other way, mm. but that that was carrying as much weight to them as anything else that was going on. Mm. I hadn't thought of that. Just something like tubes um, being intubated, obviously that's significant. But even just having an IV in an arm can be traumatizing probably for kids who haven't seen that when we're used to yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah, especially if they know the person, you know, right. if they know them really right. well, they're used to that person and their body, you know, then to suddenly see their body in such a different way is, it's a big deal. Hmm. I want to ask you also about this mom, because helping a parent through the end is also a lot to take on emotionally. And you've got kids at home. What advice do you have for this mom? Who's probably going to be, the parent's going to be away helping care for grandma. Yeah. Um, You know, what it reminds me of is that, you know, when stressors go up, supports need to go up too. Mm, And so, yeah, because sometimes the stressors can't be brought down. You know, if we can bring them down, we should bring them down. But sometimes you can't. And this is one of those moments. So I think I would really want any family in this position to up all the supports they can. So it may be that sometimes it's social support, you know, reaching out to friends who are not, you know, in the full face of the grief, but love this family, love the people in yes. it, and, and saying, yes. you know, we need your help. And, you know, Rena, you've got friends like this. I've got friends like this. Like when it comes to the end of my parents' life, like I know who I'm calling because right. they love us, but they don't have the same kind of skin in the game. And so right. they can be helpful. So that is huge. But also, Rena, one of the things I've become much more aware of is sometimes the supports are things like getting more takeout. Oh, right. gosh. Amen to that. What a great point. <laughs> so true. You know? I mean, just the basic survival of every day getting through those. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. So, you know, those kinds of things can make a difference. And then the other thing I would say is asking for what you need, right? So if you're like, I don't like takeout, but we really could use some decent food, then tell the people who love you who are not in the middle of this, here's what we could really use. If you could coordinate to have some folks bring some stuff by and make sure we don't have too much or too little, that would make all the difference in the world. And what we have to remember in these moments is people want to help. And people don't always know what to do. And I watch 
individuals who are, you know, in the center of these very painful situations feel like, oh, well, I don't want to impose on anybody. And I'm like, who? no, it's the opposite. You yeah. know, they, they're desperate to be useful. You giving them explicit instruction about what will be useful to you is a gift to them. Like, give them that gift. So I would just say, as much support as this family can call on, they absolutely should. You know, we're taught to say please and thank you, but we don't know what to do when somebody is grieving or dealing with a significant death. What do you think really helps? One of the key things as we think about helping kids through grief is to keep those, um, the people they've lost alive through remembering them and doing things like, you know, when it's middle school graduation, say, like, oh, Nana, here's what Nana would be thinking right now. Or Nana is so proud of you wherever she is. She is so proud of you. And to keep that ongoing presence um, is for kids a way that we don't forget what they've lost and we make the ongoing conversation about the person who we've loved, who we've lost, very normal, very natural to their days. And um, I think that's how as parents or adults, we keep um, keep it from feeling strange or frightening or alarming and just acknowledge like you missed her when she died and you're going to miss her at your wedding and you're going to miss her when your first child is born. And just to normalize that um, makes a huge difference in the sort of the long tail of grief. Before we go, I want to ask you about the funeral, because I think so often parents don't know what you should tell your child about the funeral and how kids process that. Oh, boy. That is the truth. Okay, so when it comes to funerals, whoever's funeral it is, back to this point we've made a couple times today, preparation, preparation, preparation. Kids should know what they are walking into. And especially if it's one where there's options, kids should be given the option of whether or not they want to walk into it. And so when it comes to the question of whether children should go to funerals or getting kids ready for funerals, what we want to do as adults is to give them the total play-by-play, -play, a complete mm -hmm. account of what to expect, and especially if there's going to be a, vo a body on mm -hmm. view. Mm -hmm. um, and because that is its own very... I mean, frankly, strange experience um, that kids will want to be prepared for. And, you know, this is also true for wakes. This is also true for other things. And so giving kids an entire account of what to expect makes it easier for them to bear, you know, everything that comes their way. And then there may be times where you want choice, right? You may say, we're not going to the wake because the casket will be closed after the wake and, you know, I'm making the call that my child does not need to see the body. Mm, mm. You also may give, you know, older kids an option. Um, and then they may get to change their mind when they get there, you know. So I think, again, prepare, 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 let them know what to expect. Kids can handle an enormous amount if they know what's coming. But funerals are tricky. And the other thing we should prepare them for is there may be very upset people at the funeral, you know. So we're often so focused on the body and the, you know, whatever servicer, you know, kind of ceremony there will be and our own experience. But we need to say, oh, you know, your Nana's best friend will be there and you should expect that she may really be very, very upset. And I want you to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. So to wrap it up, Lisa, on death and dying, what do you think your advice is to parents that they should keep in their mind as they're coping with this and trying to help their children through? It's okay to be sad in front of your kids. Mm -hmm. And I think that's often what parents are most frightened of, is if I get upset, will that upset them? And I think if you get upset in a way that feels out of control, it probably will. But I think if you are weeping and talking about missing the person and feeling very sad, and they can see that, and they can see that you just take this in stride as part of how we process emotion, that will be a great gift to your child. And um, so don't be afraid of your own sadness or your child's sadness and know that you can dip in and out of it and that you don't have to do it all at once. You know, a friend of mine once said, grief is the price you pay for love. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can't have yeah. life without death. So true. So absolutely true.
Lisa, do you have any books that you can recommend for parents on dealing with grief? Yeah, I think we kind of want to break it down by age. So for younger kids, um, there's some wonderful books. One's called The Fall of Freddie the Leaf. Um, another one's called The Tenth Good Thing About Barney, about a dog. And uh, Maria Shriver wrote a wonderful book called What is Heaven? And then there's not a huge adolescent literature, but there's some stuff that's for adults that may be useful to teens and younger kids. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a wonderful book called Grief Day by Day, which just lets people kind of deal with grief in kind of bite-sized pieces, as we say. Um, I think that's an excellent resource. And then there's another book called The After Grief about the long arc of, of bereavement. And, and I like um, the way in which it really appreciates that it takes a long, long time to get used to the idea of losing someone we love. I think so often we think it gets better after six months to a year and that it could live with you for your lifetime is something that I don't think we think about. Yeah. No, and I think often it's almost setting in at six months to a year. And I think if we can change our thinking, we're better prepared for losses and we're better prepared to support people when they face them. It's great advice. Thanks, Lisa. So, Lisa, what do you have for us for Parenting to Go? I think I want to underscore something that's come up several times today, which is preparing kids for hard things. I think sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we know something's going to be challenging, whether it's a funeral or, you know, any variety of things that we expect our kids to do or want our kids to do. And we can get anxious knowing that it may be strange for them, whatever it is, whether it's a hospital visit or, you know anything along those lines, even going to the doctor themselves for something that's different from what they've usually done. And let's never forget the power of preparation to make challenging new things a lot easier for kids to manage. It's mm. great advice and, and so much to unpack here with grief. Uh, I want to thank you so much, Lisa. There's so much here that I think can be so helpful. And I want to tell everyone about our episode next week. We're going to talk about how do you help your teen deal with college rejections. I'll see you next week, Lisa. I'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to asklisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well-being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.